session that looks at larger issues. One thing we talked a fair number of, a fair number of talks a bit about policy, what the government can do. But in, in much of the world's electricity systems, the government might influence the electricity system, they might try to steer it with policy, but it's fundamentally the private sector, companies are going to decide if a technology gets implemented, how, how the technology will be adapted, and that's particularly the case in solar technologies. Companies are not going to invest heavily in this technology unless they see a way for it to be profitable. Policy can tweak that and set up some incentives, but fundamentally, this private sector is going to do this. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen because the private sector will make multi-billion dollar investments in the technology. That's something we'd all like to see. That's not good or bad, that's just the nature of markets. But it is good if you're entrepreneurial then, because there's maybe, I don't know, we're going to find out from Dr. Lawrence, potential to be a solar billionaire. So Professor Lawrence from the School of Business here at the University of Colorado is going to talk about solar markets and perhaps teach us how to all be solar billionaires. You're here. By the time you leave, you'll all be worth at least a million. So, <laughs> hi again. My name is Steve Lawrence, and we've uh, met a couple times before, and I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about entrepreneurship and its relationship to renewable energy. So how many of you would like to be a billionaire? Most of you. A couple of you said no. Uh, you, you don't want to be a billionaire. How come? Pardon? A million would be enough. That's not a bad answer. Um, anybody else not want to be a billionaire? You, you don't? How come? I don't think money's done. <laughs> well, you know, I've thought about that. Do I want to be a bill? I must have taken it from someone else. So. No, I don't. They're buying products you want, you know. Uh, Apple Computer, I don't think they put a gun to anyone's head and said you have to buy an iPad. Uh, certainly some of those folks are worth a billion. I figured I'd like to try out being a billionaire. If I didn't like it, I could always give the money away. Um, so, <laughs> any case, we're going to talk. This is obviously sort of a a bit of a joke title in the sense that I don't think most of us have aspirations. We wouldn't be in sciences or in academics if we really wanted to be a billionaire. But, you know, nonetheless, um, I think there are lots of opportunities out there in the solar PV space, and I think there's, there's lots of opportunities over time to perhaps do very well. And, you know, one of the nice things about having assets, having resources, is it gives you the power and influence to do important things. So in any case, we're going to talk about about that today. Um, the agenda is to is to first talk about innovation, and this will be more general and more applicable to you, whether or not you want to be a billionaire, a millionaire, a thousandaire, or a dimeer, <laughs> euro bear, or something like that. Um, and then we're going to talk about its relationship to entrepreneurship, and I think the two are very closely intertwined. And to understand the first, you need to understand the first to really understand the second. So one of the things that I've been interested in, I have an engineering background. I told you that before, before I lost my way and got into business. But I have, so I consequently have a real interest in technology. And one of the things that interests me is trying to forecast technology. Where are we go, going to go? What's the world going to look like 20 years from now? And one of the things, we, one of the ways we might think about that is to look backwards and say, where have we been? What were the patterns we saw? And, um, and how can we apply those patterns into the future? So I found this book some years ago called The Lever of Riches, Technological Creativity and Economic Progress. I said, this is great. It's going to show me the patterns so that I can look forward into the future and understand what the future is going to look like. And this fellow, Joe Moker, uh, uh, wrote this book. And uh, here's what I found is that summarizing the whole book is that one, technology is unorderly. It doesn't happen in, in ways that are um, predictable or that there are, there, there are orderly patterns to them. You know, when I was a kid and interested in sciences and engineering, I used to think that science was always about you know, wearing a white lab coat in a laboratory, you know, working for five years and holding the test tube up to the light and, ah, truth. And that was sort of the way it worked. And in fact, it doesn't work that way. And you guys all know this, because well, as Einstein uh, famously said, uh, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be research. And so um, you know, that's really what science is about. But it's not an orderly process of research and development. There are few planning elements of planning or cost-benefit analysis. Um, it breaks constraints. Oftentimes, that uh, progress, technological progress and innovation 
breaks constraints that people said, oh, you don't do that, don't waste your time there, that's not going to work. And lo and behold, it works, and, and we have an innovation. We'll talk more about that. And also, there's unexplained timing. Things happen sometimes in strange ways. We couldn't have computers before we had semiconductors, before we had transistors, etc. knowledge of quantum physics and so forth. But other things in history have been really, un the timing is unexplained. For instance, the wheelbarrow and the stirrup were not developed until the Middle Ages. And you're thinking about the wheelbarrow, for instance. That's just a lever and a wheel. Why wasn't that available until, why didn't somebody think of that until the Middle Ages? If you're building the pyramids, a wheelbarrow would be really handy. But they didn't have wheelbarrows in, in, um, in Egypt during when the pyramids were built. Why did it take so long? Who knows? The other interesting thing is the stirrup. Now, why would a stirrup be a big innovation? What was the advantage of a stirrup to those? People have been riding horses for as long as they've been horses. And um, what would be the advantage of a stirrup? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Oh, so a stirrup is when you ride a horse, you have a saddle, and you put your feet in the stirrup. Yeah, I'm sorry, I should have. I'm sorry? Well, it, it, it's a military advantage, because now you can stand up or sit in the stirrup, wield a bow and arrow with some stability or a sword or whatever, and there's some famous battles in Europe that were fought, and the side that had the stirrup won because they were far more effective on horseback than those that didn't have stirrups. So just a, a bit of trivia. But in any case, lots of unexplained timings about why things happen the way they happen. It takes clever people uh, being creative for these things to happen. Another looking, you know, another very famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. How many of you know this book? Oh, you're scientists, you all should know it. Um, and this book was written by a fellow by the name of Thomas Kuhn back in the early 60s, and it's had a great influence on the philosophy of science. And what Kuhn said is that there are really two types of, of um, innovation. In, in this, he was writing specifically about the sciences, but it also applies to technology. And it applies really to lots of kinds of thinking, <clears throat> human thought in general. But he said that there is normal innovation, and this is what most of us do most of the time, where we've got a theory or we've got kind of a, a way of thinking about things. Newtonian physics would be a great example. You know, in the late 1800s, physicists and scientists felt, well, you know, we've got physics figured out. It's pretty much Newtonian physics, and we just kind of have to wrap a few things up. And then there were some experiments run in the early 1900s in which they were doing power curves, and I'll probably tell you more about this than I know. And we're running this experiment in, in the modern physics lab in, in college, where there's an energy curve, but there are little blips in the energy curve. And they said, well, that must be some experimental artifact or some, you know, something here going on we don't quite understand that has to do with the experiment itself. But it kept appearing over and over and over again, and lo and behold, that was evidence of quantum physics. And so Newtonian physics turns out just to be a small subset of a much larger physics. And so the, but most of the time we, wor we work in normal innovation, in which we are adding bit by bit to established knowledge with established theories. In contrast to that is revolutionary innovation, where the whole field gets shaken up. Um, you know, there was this, again, there was this notion that somehow there had been some neutrons that traveled faster than the speed of light between, uh, you know, what was this? Switzerland and somewhere else, this, just recently, I forget, in Europe somewhere. And there was this, that if that had been proven to be the case, which I think it since has been turned out to be an anomaly, that would have shaken up uh, physics to its core. But, you know, revolutionary innovation is in response to an intellectual crisis where things just aren't working anymore. Um, Newtonian physics to quantum physics would be one example. Another example uh, that had much, well, probably even more important was uh, the Copernican revolution in the 1500s. Copernicus, uh, prior to Copernicus and his fellows, that the Earth was thought to be the center of the universe and the sun and this moon and the stars and everything circled the Earth. And as they got better and better astronomical obs observations, they started plotting these orbits of the, of the bodies around the Earth, and they got these really strange loop-to-loop -loop kind of curved views and all kinds of strange things. And it got harder and harder to explain until Copernicus came along and said, well, you know, if we just make the sun the center of the universe, uh, then suddenly all those loop-to-loops become nice circles. He thought circles, not ellipses, but okay. And, of course, that suddenly made science a lot easier, made observation make more sense, and he was 
heroically welcomed by the scientific community and, and embraced by all and said, you know, Copernicus, you're, the, you're our man. You're shaking your head no? That's not exactly what happened. What happened? Well, he, first of the, most of his colleagues made fun of him. Yes. He was almost burdened for it. Well, not really, but almost. And he was kicked out of a lot of stuff. So. Yeah, I, well, and, and indeed, that, those sorts of things happened to Galileo as well. Copernicus, as I understand the story, did, was wise enough not to publish his work until it wasn't widely disseminated until after his death. Um, and one of his followers, uh, Bruno, a guy by the name of Bruno, actually widely promoted this. Hey, guys, this makes sense. And he was burned at the stake for his trouble. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes, revolutionary innovation is not immediately accepted. And you say, well, that happened a long time ago. That never happened today. It happens all the time. For instance, in, um, not too many years ago, it was thought that stomach ulcers, you know, uh, bleeding in your stomach, was caused by just too much acid in your stomach. And the way to get around that was not eat acidic foods, eat a bland diet, uh, reduce your stress levels, which is probably still a good idea, et cetera. And this one guy had this heretical theory that it was caused by bacteria. And no one believed him, and he was laughed at and ridiculed. Unfortunately, he was not burned at the stake because we don't do that too much anymore. But you know, he was not accepted by the scientific community until finally he drank some of this bacteria he thought was causing ulcers and gave himself ulcers, and <laughs> suddenly people believed him. I guess that might be like being burned at the stake. But um, you know, many times, radical innovation is not immediately accepted. What would be some things that are going on right now that, that are being, well, laughed at, or not, if not laughed at, at least sort of not accepted, and people are thought to be um, you know, out of the box. Yes? Homeopathy. Yeah, homeopathy. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it may be quackery, but maybe there's something there. Anything else? You know, you get both sides in the climate debate. You get some folks that, you know, that uh, most, most scientists have one accepted view of things, and others, the others, another view. Um, or, what, large group of scientists believe that global warming is real and here and it's, it's happening faster and faster. Some others re reject that. You know, most likely, I think most of us would place our bet on the first set, but the other set, you know, maybe in fact it is solar or, or galactic clouds or where we are or something like that. That, that, will, that would be sort of a revolutionary finding if it happened. I don't think it will happen, but that's the, that's the, the, um, reality of revolutionary thinking is, is that nobody agrees with you, okay? But nonetheless, we have these two normal ways of thinking, normal innovation, revolutionary innovation. Often things that maybe think revolutionary don't turn out to be correct, uh, um, cold fusion being one of those. But when it does work, it break, establishes a new paradigm, it breaks paradigms, and we all are prisoners of our paradigms. We couldn't live without paradigms. Paradigms are sort of a a, a, a standard way of thinking about things, about perceiving the world. When we're children, for instance, we drop a, we learn quickly that if we drop something heavy, we better move our foot or it's going to hurt our foot. That is a paradigm that works very well on the surface of the earth, unless you're under, standing in water, in which case you have more time to move your foot. And of course, if you're orbiting the earth in a satellite, you don't have to worry at all because the things just will float there. So most of the time, paradigms work. And they're very important to us, and science wouldn't, and innovation would not proceed without them. So, paradigm is a set of rules and regulations that establish and define boundaries, governs how to behave inside the boundaries in order to be use, successful and useful. Again, Newtonian physics works really, really well lots of the time, especially in the kind of the scale of, of human life and the time frame of human life. But in lots of other domains, it, it's irrelevant or it doesn't work at all. <coughs> So the paradigm of Newtonian physics works someplace, but not others. Examples of paradigms uh, in the past are the following, and you may have seen these on the internet. Everything that can be invented has been invented, said the, uh, the director or commissioner of the US Patent Office in 1899. There's nothing left to do. It's all been invented. Uh, nothing happened in the, in the you know, between then and now. It's, uh, Louis Pasteur's theory of germs is ridiculous fiction. Airplanes are interesting toys, but have no military value. There's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home, said Ken Olson, the, the founder of Digital Equipment Corporation, 
which uh, made many computers, but he, he made, you know, went from, from mainframes to mini computers, but couldn't understand why anyone would want to go smaller to something on your desk. And then Bill Gates famously said many years ago, 640K memory ought to be enough for anybody. <laughs> so we, these paradigms are with us all the time. We don't often don't recognize them, that we do have a set way of thinking that often, you know, sometimes will be, will be upset. What's, what are the implications for us? Is that, is that um, humans are prisoners of our paradigms. We couldn't live without them. Yes? I just remarked that the, the, the thing about us, everything is now within us, and it's all now just the findings of the constants uh, yeah. that first set up or held in uh, the centuries ago. Yeah, yeah the, um, it's, it's kind of a common, where can we go from here? We're wondering if we'll move so wonderful. What further things can we contribute? Well. Oftentimes, things happen in ways that we, uh, we just um, don't anticipate. We'll talk more about that. We abandon paradigms of difficulty, resist, resist change, that in many, in many, in science and technology and in business and in, in almost any domain of human life, we come up with a certain pattern of thinking, thinking about things. And to change that pattern is challenging because it upsets our worldview. Um, so we resist thinking outside the box. And, Entrepreneurship in science is about creating paradigms in many ways and about breaking them when the facts demand. I mean, that, that science really is about testing, testing, testing theories, right? And making sure that with finer and finer refinement that the theories and hypotheses we have are accurate. Um, and sometimes we find that they're not accurate and we have to revise our thinking. And that change in thinking can be difficult. Breaking paradigms can be difficult. And that has a lot to do with entrepreneurship because in many cases we're trying to get people to change the way they do things. That brings us to this notion of prospect theory, which is um, which when you're thinking about trying to commercialize a new idea or move an, really move an, an idea into, uh, in, advance an idea in a lot of domains, prospect theory has some, some uh, important things to say. Kind of, this is developed by two social scientists by the name of Kahneman and Tversky. Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for this um, in economics. Tversky, unfortunately, died of cancer prior to winning of the Nobel Prize, or he would have shared in the prize, uh, but he, they don't award the Nobel Prize posthumously, so after you're dead, so he didn't get it. So stay alive. Make sure you collect your Nobel Prize. And so here's basically how prospect theory works. Suppose I made you the following bet. I'll give you a euro, or a dollar, or whatever uh, RMB, or whatever your currency is. And I give it to you. But if, if, upon giving it to you, say, I want to make a bet. If uh, we'll flip a coin, and if you win the bet, I'll give you $10. And if I win the bet, I'll take the dollar back. OK? How many of you would take my bet and flip the coin for $10? How many of you would keep the dollar? A few of you. OK. Um, why would you keep it? Because I would in my hand. You have a dollar in the hand. And so you'd rather have a dollar in the hand. What's the expected value of the, of the bet? Five dollars. $5, because there's a 50-50 chance you're going to get $10 rather than one. And so many, you know, a dollar in a hand may be worth more than 10. But most, most people, if it's a dollar, would take the $5 bet when I've run this before. Now let's change the bet. I'm going to give you a million dollars. And the same bet. We'll flip a coin. And if you, if I, if you lose the bet, I take the million back. And if, I, if, if you win the bet, you get 10 million. Hmm. Now, how many of you would take the bet in that case? Most of us probably would. My wife would kill me. <laughs> you had a million dollars and you bet it on Tim. What kind of, you know, a million dollars or euros or whatever would change most of our lives significantly. And so Kahneman Tversky really kind of played on that insight and built, his, you know, built up through lots of experimentation and so forth, gave, you know, discovered that um, people are really have sort of a pattern to the way they make decisions. We tend to be quite risk averse. We, we value what's in our hand more than we value what might be. And we're, we protect what we have versus more than we, we will risk what we don't have. 
And this is shown again and again and again, and I won't go through this graph, but it kind of shows the nonlinear nature of, nature of our decision making. The straight dotted line is if you're, if you're risk neutral, if you're risk neutral, you take the $10 million bet because the expected outcome is $5 million. Is so the experiment one-time or it's not going to No, no, it's a one-time bet. A repeated <laughs> experiment, good point. If we're going to do it over and over and over again, you bet. We take that bet every time. Um, so, but even if, you know, if you're risk neutral, hey, I expect the outcome of this, taking the bet is $4 million and more than not taking the bet. So, but hey, a million dollars really will rock our lives. And so they talked about this in, in many different contexts, that, that human beings are not risk neutral, they're not rational in an economic sense, that what they do, you know, we will, we will value things we have more than things we don't have. And that's important for entrepreneurship because it makes people hard to change. And there's some, here's a copy of a Scientific American article, other work that says we may actually be neurologically wired this way. And it makes sense from a, from a survival point of view, from a you know, selection point of view, is that if you're alive and, and at least living, there's a, there's a cost to taking risks. Because if you say, well, let's see what's across on the other side of the mountain, there might be lions and bears on the other side of the mountain and you die. So if you're, if you're surviving where you are, then taking those risks might not, in history, might not be valuable. Although taking some risks probably is because you might be in a, a, a valley of paradise and be able to proliferate and your, and your gene pool would, would uh, dominate others. Anyways. So what this means when we're thinking about, uh, about trying to commercialize innovation is that, or technology, is the following simple graph that tells a lot. If the behavioral change is low, that means we don't have to make a lot of changes in the way we do things. You know, our, our routine, the things we have don't change much. But the product benefit or the service benefit is high, then we've got a winner because I don't have to do much, but I can gain a lot. So there's no, I'm not giving up anything I have, even old habits, I just get a lot. Um, Conversely, if the behavioral change is really high on the vertical axis, I got to change a lot of the ways I do things, and the and the benefit is relatively low, maybe positive still, but low. It's really hard to get people to change. And then if it's high behavioral change but high degree of benefit, that would be the long haul. And I would assert that's a lot of where solar PV is right now. If you put solar on your roof, there's some upfront costs. And and the benefits are long term, and so it's sort of a long haul to get people to make that change. Now, if you could just go to the, go to the hardware, pay $100 for solar panels to put in your roof, and you wouldn't pay electric bills anymore, people would do it and, and you know do it immediately. But it's there's more behavioral change, economic change, so it's just, we're kind of in this for the long haul from the solar PV point of view, as this this particular graph points out. We'll talk about some ways around this in a few minutes. But this is really important. That's why, you know, famously engineers are, are said, you know, if you be, we like to think if I build a better mousetrap, the world will be a tap to my door. Meaning, if I can only build a little bit better mousetrap, and you all know what a mousetrap is, things to catch mice, um, is that if it's a little bit better, that's okay. But if it's just a little bit better, people probably aren't going to, they'd have to change their habits, and, and they're not going to do it. So, um, we, what we're looking for is significant change. Implications of that humans are risk averse, for prospect theory, is that we really don't like change that much. There has to be pretty good benefits for us to change even simple habits. For fast adoption of technology, we want large advantages and benefits. We, there has to be significant advantages. So as a matter of fact, Andy Grove who was the, one of the founders of Intel company that makes the computers and Intel and a lot of computers, or the processors and a lot of uh, computers. He said that uh, he was the founder and longtime CEO. He's since retired. But you know, we're looking for for change that gives us ten times the benefit. Now, that's a lot, but that's sort of the goal that they set for themselves in Intel. We're not going to make little changes. We're going to make big quantum changes in order to get people to pay attention and buy our products. And so we want to also want to change as few habits as possible. So 
So this kind of gets us back to technological forecasting, all these, you know, um, <coughs> human behavior, the, the lack of consistency in, in, in forecasting and so forth. And that, there's this really interesting book that I found um, a couple of years ago. I actually found a paper and then bought the book subsequently. This was written in 1967, 40 years ago, um, 45 years ago, called The Year 2000, A Framework for Speculation on the Next 33 Years. So they're looking forward, what's the year 2000 going to look like? It's going to be very different. It's going to be fantastic in many ways. And here's what they came up with. Um, this was a paper that reviewed this. I won't go into the details here. But they had a whole bunch, of, several hundred different projections uh, using panels of experts as what the year 2000 would look like. They got some things right. Multiple applications of lasers, sensing and measuring. Inexpensive global communications using satellites, lasers, and light pipes. All that's happened. They got a lot of things really wrong. For instance, new aircraft, uh, ground effect, vertical takeoff and landing, uh, short takeoff and landing, super helicopters, giant jets, some of those things did come to pass, but they, they, they also had things in there such as um, um, uh, personal helicopters that would you commute to work on and things like that. Extensive use of cyborg techniques, you know, mating computers and robots together, sort of the bionic man sort of thing. Extensive use of robots slave to humans, in factories perhaps, but not elsewhere. But they got a lot of things kind of wrong. They just didn't quite get that figured out. But the thing I found most fascinating was what they missed. And you know, they got some things right, some things wrong. But nothing about the internet or network computers. They, nothing about mobile telecommunications, mobile phones, which by the year 2000 were, were ubiquitous. Uh, nothing about mobile computing. You know, back in this age, this was before PC started to appear. And uh, you know, I was in high school at this point. And you know, I was reading science fiction, and in all the science fiction books I read, they, they knew, you know, these books, they knew computers were important. But if they're going to be more powerful, they're going to have to be a lot bigger. And I recall reading one uh, account of uh, uh, one story in which computers had gotten so powerful and big, they had to devote them, they had to build them in an asteroid. The whole asteroid was a big computer. Because, you know, more powerful meant bigger. A little more powerful means smaller and smaller and smaller and more smaller. And so forecasting, well, you know, this work, these forecasts are insightful. You know, as Neil Bohr's said some years ago, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. You've probably seen this quote. So we forecast linearly, but innovation is nonlinear, sometimes continuous, in that, in that forecasting really is, uh, look, peering into the future, what we tend to do is to extrapolate linearly. That we take what we have today and just say, well, the future is going to be like, Today, it's just going to be more of it, or faster, or bigger, or whatever. And what the danger of that is, is that we miss kind of left-hand turns or right-hand turns that, that progress takes, like the internet. You know, in 1992, I was around uh, and th thinking about such things, I suppose. Nobody was investing in the internet. It was just uh, something that they use in universities for geeks to talk to each other. Two years later, it was the next big thing. You know, the World Wide Web had come about, as well as uh, graphical browsers. And now, suddenly, the whole world exploded. It was a hockey stick kind of exp exponential growth. So sometimes the world moves in very unexpected ways. That brings us to chaos theory. And you probably know something about chaos theory. Chaos theory says that initial conditions are critical. Where we start is critical. What's happening when we start is critical. Small perturbations in the initial environment can have large subs subsequent changes in eventual technological evolution. You know, this is the butterfly flapping its wings in Singapore, Singapore, Shanghai, creates air currents that become, you know, typhoons over the Pacific that cause rain in LA uh, two weeks later. But very small perturbations in the, in the starting conditions have huge changes in where we end up. It's path dependent and self reinforcing. And that, you know, once we, you start down a path, it's hard to change that path. There's an inherent randomness to it, and positive feedback reinforces the revolutionary path so that as, as progress continues, momentum builds and it gets harder and harder to um, uh, change where we're going. An example that I use here in Colorado that may, may or may not make sense to you, depending on where you're from, is a snowball at the top of a mountain. 
you have a small ball of snow and start rolling down a hill, the direction you're pointing when you start it down the hill makes a big difference. Along the way, as it gains momentum and mass, as it picks up more and more snow as it rolls down the hill or the mountain, uh, makes it harder and harder to change the path of the snowball thing that's growing in size. You know, random perturbation, it hits a stump, it hits the you know, side of a tree, it hits a stone, will change that path as it moves down the mountain. And that its path, you know, that it's self-reinforcing in that as it gets more massive and gains more velocity, it's going to be harder and harder to change that path. And the same is true with lots of things, you know, if you think about technological progress, that it, once things get started, it's very hard to change them. That's really important in renewable energy because of the huge incumbent infra infrastructure we have. You know, we start, we'll talk about that in a minute, but you know, it's very difficult to change the grid in a developed country. A couple examples, uh, well, a really good one is the PC operating system. This is, uh, you know who these guys are? You recognize either one of them? Bill Gates on the left, the founder of Microsoft. The guy on the right, anybody recognize him? You should, or you might have. His name is Gary Kildall. And he, uh, at the time that Microsoft was getting started, back in, what would that be? This would have been like the early 80s. Gary Kildall was the CEO, and he was a computer scientist, and he was, this, he was the founder and CEO, the president of a, 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 um, I'm forgetting the name, it's a, oh, CPM, of an operating system called CPM, which was the dominant 8-bit computer operating system during that era. Uh, computers were, were, there was an Apple and then there was everything else CPM, sort of like Windows today or Apple operating system. At the time, CPM was the dominant non-Apple operating system. And, and he had a company called Intergalactic Digital Research, um, something like, you know, profound like that. And he had the dominant system. And he was, uh, and he kind of owned the marketplace. In about that time, in the early 80s, IBM was developing their 16-bit IBM PC. And they decided that they needed to be in the computer space. And they decided they couldn't build it themselves because it would be too expensive. Uh, they were designing it themselves using their normal processes because they figured that if they used their normal R&D processes, a PC would cost a quarter of a million dollars. And they didn't think too many people would buy a PC for that kind of money. So they went shopping for the parts to build uh, kind of an off-the-shelf PC, 16-bit PC, and they needed a operating system to run their 16-bit Intel processor that they were going to buy. And they went to Bill Gates thinking he had one. He didn't. He was in the in the uh, uh, applications business at the time, not in the operating system business. So he sent him off to California to, bit, to visit Gary Kildall, who was developing a 16-bit version of CPM. Now it turns out that Gary Kildow was an amateur pilot and he went flying that day and stood up IBM. And you know, this is not a good thing. These guys had flown in from New York and they were important guys and this, this, this hick in California stood them up and, and they flew back to, Cal, to, to Bill Gates in Washington and said, you know, Gates, we, uh, this guy wouldn't see us and uh, he's kind of a mess. Could you develop one for us, an uh, operating system for us? You got any other ideas? Well, it turns out that Gates and Steve, Al Steve Allen, his, or Paul Allen, his partner, knew of a company called Seattle Software that had been developing a 16-bit operating system. They bought the rights to that for $50,000, and Bill Gates now is worth a gazillion dollars. And uh, Gary Kildall is forgotten because he, you know, that, that initial condition uh, didn't, uh, if he, if, imagine if he had met IBM, made a deal with them, Bill Gates would probably be a successful business guy somewhere, but unknown, and Gary Kildall might be worth billions. So initial conditions are critical. Another uh, bit of chaos is the following, is that in the United States and other parts of the world, in the, the rail gauge is four foot eight and a half inches apart. Two rails and a, and a, and a rail line are four foot eight and a half inches apart. And the question is, why are they four foot eight and a half inches apart? That's a strange dimension. Why not four foot six or five feet or something, at least an even inch? And um, it turns out that uh, you ask the question, why is it that way? Well, it turns out that the first English railroads were that, that width. Okay, why were they that width? Uh, the European wagons had wheels that were that far apart. Okay, fair enough. So they, they used the same kind of equipment to build the railroads that they used to build the wagons. Well, why were the wagons that far apart? 
Well, it's because of rutted Roman roads that survived since Roman era in Europe. The ruts in the roads were four foot eight and a half inches apart. Okay? And so that's the reason, it's because of the ruts in the road. And so the question is, well, why, why were the ruts that far apart? Well, it turns out the Roman war chariots had wheels that, that were that far apart. And so the ruts in the roads were, were worn by Roman war chariots uh, over the eons and subsequent wagons. And so that's why they were the, that far apart. Well, why were the Roman chariots that far apart? Well, the story goes that that was the width of the rear end of two horses. And so the U.S. rail gauge, according to the story, is four foot eight and a half inches apart, apart based on the width of two horses that pulled the Roman war chariots thousands of years ago. The story doesn't end there. It was um, that the space shuttle that recently has been retired has two SRB boost, solid state booster rockets on the side uh, that are made in, were made in Utah by Thiokol Corporation. And they would have liked, you know, those are the white things in the picture there, if you can see them on the sides. It, it, it turns out that the, that the, the, those booster rockets, they would like to have made them fatter and shorter, but they had to carry them by railroad, and they had to traverse the tunnels and so forth that were made to this four foot eight and a half inch rail gauge, and so they had to make them longer and taller than they would have liked to otherwise. And so, you know, the up, up tight of that, the up, up shot of that is that the major design feature of what is arguably the world's most advanced transportation system was determined over 2,000 years ago by the width of, of a horse's rump. And, um, you know, it's a fun story, but it illustrates, it illustrates that these, you know, one, initial conditions are critical, and two, you know, the path we take and the standards we set early on have a huge impact on where we are and how much change we can make. You know, think about the electrical grid. In the United States, it's AC, three phases, 120 volts, 60 hertz. In Europe, it's what, 220, 50 hertz. Um, elsewhere in the world, you get different versions of these things. But you know, now that we have that in, in an incumbent infrastructure, how hard would it be to say, you know, we really need to change that to 250 volts in 30 hertz, or 120 hertz, or something? It would be well nigh, it costs trillions of dollars in North America to make that change. We're stuck with this, that, that dimension, that way of doing things, as, as Europe is with its standards and Asia is with its standards, you, just, you don't change a huge system like that. So we are prisoners in many ways of the incumbent technologies that were determined sometimes by circumstance or just, you know, fate of, you know, kind of casual choices generations ago. You all use typewriters, you know why we use that, why the keys are laid out the way they are? The QWERTY keyboard? QWERTY, key, QWERTY keyboard? keyboard? I'm sorry? Keyboard. -E yeah, QWERTY. Yeah. yeah. So why why are the keys laid out that way? Why do they put the letters where they are? They're not yeah, alphabetical. I'm sorry. Yeah. Say again. They, they were actually deliberately made to slow down typists for the early mechanical typewriters because in the early mechanical typewriters, good typists could type so fast the keys would would, would smash together and jam, and so. We, we use this to this day because it slows us down. But we're stuck. There have been other alternative designs over time, dating back to the 20s. But no one will use them because we have this huge incumbent uh, population that knows the QWERTY keyboard and never changed. So this is a real problem for, for renewable energy is we're stuck with this kind of infrastructure that we, we was designed 100 years ago, which doesn't really fit that well today's needs. Um, so early standard setting is critical. That's why there's lots, lots of companies get involved in standard setting because they want to have a, a chance to point the technology in the way they want to take it. But it can also be sidestepped by innovation. And we'll, well, as an example, in the developing world, I, th I think we talked about this before, are they putting down copper wire for telephones? No, they're just going direct to cell phones. Why bother? You know, copper is expensive. It, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of time and money to lay copper wires. Put up some cell towers, and you got a you got a cell network. Sell some cheap phones, and off you go. <clears throat> so if you can sidestep innovation, all the better. I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time. And talk about the following, and this is I think really important for for solar PV, for PV, you know, solar generally and renewable energy generally. 
And that is this notion of crossing the chasm, or chasm rather. Um, many, many technologies seem to have a, gained some early adopters very quickly. You know, here in Boulder, a lot of people, when, when solar PV incentives were put in place, a number of people put solar on their home almost immediately. A lot of other people kind of took a wait and see attitude. We still are taking a wait and see attitude. There's folks that, you know, you probably know folks that will always buy the latest computer gadget. When the, when the new iPad came out, they, they were one of the first ones to buy it. They always have to have the newest, you know, uh, uh, technology going or particular certain kinds of technology. Most other people, though, uh, take kind of a wait and see attitude. Let's see what this really is doing. Let's see if it really works. Let's see if it really provides benefit. And those are the folks you eventually need to get to if you're going to have a successful product. You need to get into that space in order to be, you, get, you have to get the majority buying your product in order to be successful. And that's, that's a very common problem in technological in, in commercialization and innovation. How do you get the bulk of people to use it? The way that most companies do it is that they'll try to be all things to all people. Oh, over here you want, you want, you want a whistle on it, over here you want a bell on it, over here you want red, we'll give you all those choices. And, and this, this theory, if you will, or this, this notion, is that you shouldn't do that. You should pick one area that is um, where they really want your product, need your product, and they make the product 100% good for them. Conquer that market, then branch out from there. Don't try to do everything at once. You know, find that, that niche market that really needs your product before you try to do all things for all people. We'll talk about some uh, examples in the PV, PV space in a moment, but you all know the Segway? You've seen Segways, right? This was launched in 2001. They thought this was going to revolutionize urban transport. It was going to just make the world a very different place. And in fact, they, they built a factory to build 10,000 a week. And in fact, they sold 10 a week. How come you didn't buy a Segway? Shame on you. It, it's urban, it, should, it could revolutionize urban transport. Why didn't you buy it? I'm sorry? I, I just tried one and I was really good to kill myself. <laughs> OK, you almost killed yourself. That's not cool. I've got a bike. Why do I do this? I'm sorry? I've got a bike. Why do I do this? Well, it's because this is cool. It's self-balancing. But it's expensive. It's really hard to control. But it's cool. It's self-balancing. <laughs> but I already have a bike that I don't have to pay. But it's cool. It's self-balancing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's, you know, when you kill yourself, too. That's not cheap. That's a lot of money. Uh, it's still about that price today. Um, it, you know, what's it do that a bike can't do? I mean, it, it won't go up and down curbs. You can do that on, on if somebody steals it, you're out a lot of money. Um, it's uh, what do you do in the rain, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they fell in love with the technology, but they, it provides no particular benefit for for um, anybody in general. Who in specific would think that, a, that a, might think a Segway was really a cool, a good deal? What kind of what niche market might think? Yes, and that going from like one building uh, other inside campus is good, but not for like. Transport. Yeah, inside of buildings or warehouses or whatever. Like for big companies inside. Right. So where they where can only afford this kind of. Uh, they can afford it, and and there are people. It's faster probably, yeah. and, and you don't have a weather to worry about and so forth. Yes. Can be good for tourist industry. Yeah, and some some tourist spots they use these things. So what you mean? Who else might like this? Other niche market you might focus on. Big shopping centers, perhaps, where there's a lot of walking. I'm sorry? Disabled. Disabled people, people that have a hard time walking, that this could be, this could be very valuable. They can't ride a bike, uh, but, but need to get around, et cetera, et cetera. And so rather than you know, focusing on a niche market that they could conquer and really serve well, they tried to be, uh, we're going to revolutionize um, uh, urban transportation because it's cool and self-balancing. Shame on you for not buying it. So here's an example of where you may have seen these. They're, these are, I'm sure these are not cheap. But this is a self-balancing wheelchair. I was in a store one time a few years ago, and there's this guy kind of cruising by on the other side of the, uh, there's a clothing store on the other side of the rack of clothing. And I said, well, that's kind of interesting. It's moving pretty smoothly. And, you know, <laughs> but then at the end, this thing appeared. And I, oh my god, i got to catch him, because it's balancing on the back two wheels. 
the Nellis Segway that was built into a wheelchair. Now it's really neat. Now you've got a, 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 a man in this case that could not, you know, he was a, a paraplegic and it, it raised up his height to more of a, a natural adult height and he could uh, lower it to go up and down stairs. This thing's quite nimble. And so that's a really cool application of this technology. And maybe if they had focused more on those niche markets, it would, could have, they could have driven down the learning curve we talked about last time, gotten the cost down, so that it makes it more attractive to more people. Now, I don't think it'll ever compete with a bicycle, but um, for people that can't ride or don't want to ride a bike, this could be a good alternative. <clears throat> so, implications for renewable energy venturing. You know, think about when you're developing, you know, if you're, in this case of solar PV, PV technologies, who must have this technology? Who would pay a lot of money to have it? You know, what niche market could we address that would really be, you know, just enthusiastic about having it? Rather than trying to talk general homeowners into putting solar PV on their roof to save a few, you know, save a relatively small amount of money over, well, it's a lot of money over time, but that's the problem, it's over time. Who really needs this technology? Across the, across the chasm to, to, to start to address that larger market. Um, look for markets in which to flourish, then grow into other markets. Don't start by addressing everybody. It's a, you know, say, well, all we need is 1% of the whole world and we'll have a really successful company. It's like saying, if only everybody in, in North America gave me a dollar, I'd be, I'd be a multimillionaire. Well, yeah, get, good luck getting everyone to give you, you know, a quarter, let alone a dollar. Um, so, Focus, 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 I think is the lesson here. And then finally, talking about this, this is a very famous uh, in business circles article now by a fellow by the name of Christensen at Harvard Business School. They came up with this idea of disruptive technologies. First off, most technologies have a physical limit that looks like this S curve. And I don't spend a lot of time on this. I think you, you buy into this. At some point, the thing gets better and better and better, but it tips over, you kind of push the envelope of the curve. And um, sort of the of the technology. But the disruptive technology is, uh, works like this is that as the old technology sort of is reaching its limit, there can be new disruptive technologies that come in and that will eventually surpass the old technology. Examples include you know, sailing vessels versus steam powered vessels. The early steam powered vessels were not as efficient, they were noisy, they tended to blow up and catch fire, not particularly attractive characteristics. But they, and so they were not as efficient as or as attractive early on to most shippers. They used sailing ships for most of the 1800s. But for some shippers or some innovators, uh, it was very, very useful. And so, you know, steamships on the Mississippi River in this nation and elsewhere, I'm sure, around the world became early on very popular because sailing ships don't work well on rivers, um, at least nearly as well as steamships. And so over time, steamships were improved and improved and improved until they, we don't see sailing ships used for commercial transport anymore except some cruises or for hobbyists or for just pleasure. Uh, other examples of where one technology pulled out, you know, pushed out another one that was initially wasn't as good. Can you think of any examples? But one that's going on right now, it's been going on for, you know, in succession for a long time, is lighting. What's lighting going to look like in 10 years? What kind of lights are we going to have? Probably LED. You know, we had incandescent, we had fluorescent, we had sodium vapor, we have you know, uh, CFLs, and now, we're, now we have uh, 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 LED lighting. is expensive, although it's a lot cheaper than it was. It's not quite as good yet as, or flexible as uh, uh, other types of lighting, but it's coming along. And everyone that I've talked to in the lighting business says, yeah, as we learn, push down the learning curve and get better and better at it, most of our lighting is going to LED. And then who knows beyond that? Same as the display technology. Say again? Same as the display technology. Display. Display technology. Yes, yes, indeed. Absolutely. And, you know, we're going to all the CDs to LEDs and then OLEDs. OLEDs, yep. So this is a very, very common uh, occurrence. Now, the reason I bring this up is because frequently, when you first see the new technology, it says, well, that's not very good. Who would want to buy that? You know, look at, see, think about solar PV, um, putting it on your roof. Yeah, it's better than, you know, you can make a, a financial case for it, especially with some incentives that over 20 years it's going to save you some money. 
But it's not one of these things like, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta you know, I'm leaving work now, I gotta go buy my rooftop solar. But it is for some people, and I think in time it will be, that's my personal view is, that solar PV will be ubiquitous in the world in ways that it's not now. Uh, it's just gonna, you know, that's this disruptive technology that doesn't look so attractive right now for lots of uses, but over time it'll grow and become very, very attractive. And so just because it's not as good now or it's, and or it's more expensive now doesn't mean that as you move down that learning curve that you're gonna surpass the incumbent technology, which in our case is you know, fossil electricity over a grid. We'll see where that goes. So incumbents can be usurped by disruptive technologies. That there are lots of examples of companies that do not react quickly enough to a new technology that are no, you know, that didn't survive. Can you think of any examples? Kodak. Kodak, great example. They actually helped invent digital cameras, but they couldn't react fast enough, and they didn't know exactly how to react, and they're now on their death throes, I think. The railroads didn't react, they're still great for freight, but passenger railroads have pretty much disappeared because they, in North America, thank you, I see some of you from other parts of the world, so what? Um, in North America, the North American passenger railroads never, never really uh, thought about air transport as an alternative to what they're doing because it's expensive and relatively dangerous and so forth, but now there is no more passenger railroad service in this country except for some urban commuter transport. Other parts of the world, yes, but even there, there's a lot of competition from, from uh, air. So incumbents are often locked into an older technology. Think about Eastman Kodak. They had a huge film business. If suddenly they converted to digital cameras, they'd have to give up that, that film business and they'd be out of business. So the fact that they're locked into an incumbent technology often is an advantage for the new player on the block because they don't have that uh, they don't have that huge weight of the incumbent uh, uh, innovation or technology on their shoulders. One last thing I want to leave you with in this introduction really is the necessity, the necessity of trial and inevitability of, of failure. And this is a picture of a book that I found this in, and it's really an interesting book about creativity and innovation. But one of the things that was in this book, the Nobel laureates are differentiated by their volume of work more than any other attribute. Obviously, they're very smart people, but there are lots of smart people out there doing the same kind of work. What differentiates them? Are they smarter? No. Are they more handsome? No. Are they, um, you know, what, what differentiates them? And the one thing that seems to differentiate Nobel laureates from others is that they just throw more stuff against the wall. They get more work out there. Uh, they, they just are prolific. And um, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of what they do is really top, you know, the best work, but they, enough of it is very good and makes a contribution that they eventually are very successful and in their case win the Nobel Prize. An example from a different domain is Mozart. You know, Mozart's acknowledged to be one of the greatest composers of all time. He has a prolific uh, corpus of, uh, of work and you hear it on the radio all the time and, and it's just, it's, it seems to be ubiquitous. But the facts are, is that we only listen to about half of what Mozart composed and only about a quarter of what he composed regularly. Why don't we listen to the other half? What's wrong with the other half? Maybe because the media don't provide it. Uh, perhaps. You know, sometimes though, you know, there are things that weren't popular in his day have become popular in our day and vice versa. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say uh, maybe there's something good out there, but some people keep on some point. I mean, this word is based on the media. So okay. if something has no support from the media, maybe it will collapse very easily. Uh, perhaps. I mean, that, that may be part, part of it. There may be some hidden gems in the 50% we don't, that we don't listen to that just somehow never got the publicity or the airtime or whatever. But from what I've read and talked to people who are, in the, I'm not a musician, but who are, uh, understand classical music, well, the other half just isn't all that good. You know, it's not bad, but it's just not that, it's not as good as his good stuff. And so, you know, I figure, well, that kind of gives me permission, permission to do things that sometimes aren't, don't work out as well as I hope they will. Because if, if it works for Mozart, it'll probably work for me. Um, so the point of this is, is that, you know, part of, the, part of the success generally, I believe, and, and I think if you're commercializing technology, you gotta try a lot of things. In the entrepreneurship world, there's now this uh, kind of expression, 
uh, get to plan B. And whatever plan A is, whatever you're planning to do when you start a business or commercializing a technology, it's not going to work. Just, just realize your initial thoughts is you're going to learn and you're going to have to go to plan B and then to C and D and E. And try different things, fail fast until you get it right. Or move on to a new idea. And you may be right that maybe if only we listen to that other 50%, we find it's terrific, but I expect we find that a lot of it's pretty mediocre. Um, and again, I'm going to skip through this. And idea generation is chaotic. Where, where good ideas come from is, is not a nice orderly, again, this is back to the original, it's not holding test tube up to the light and finding truth. It's, it's, it's good ideas come from anywhere and nowhere. Um, so here's finish up with this. So we've talked a lot about innovation, the characteristics of innovation, and what I want to leave you with are just six ideas about how to think about starting with, you know, starting, starting a business or starting, you know, to commercialize or, or to um, uh, cause the adoption of a new technology. All right, and these are the six, and we'll go through each one of them based on what we just talked about. First off. Yes. Yep. Find underserved markets. Find markets that that don't have a lot of people focused on them. And one of the ways to do that is the bottom of the pyramid. You know, half of the world's population or more doesn't have electricity or very reliable electricity. That's a huge potential market. Um, it's underserved. If you can figure out a way to address that market you'd be doing very well. This is a picture that one of my students took a few years ago on a vacation trip to Lake Titicaca over spring break in Peru. And this is one of these floating villages that float around on the lake. And you can barely see it, but there in the upper left at the top of one of those uh, um, pillars is a solar panel. Can you see it up there? It's kind of an edge on. And you can imagine how much even a little bit of electricity would, uh, a little bit of power, what a difference that would make in these people's lives. And I found similar pictures on the line of you know, people in little villages with just one solar panel and a small battery. That provides enough light at night to see, read, uh, a little bit would make a huge, huge difference. And, the, and once, once you got the equipment, it's free. So look for those, un you know, those underserved niches, whatever they are. Another is to identify unmet needs. And the story that goes with this one is, in the, for those of you that, most of you that probably don't know U.S. history, in 1849 was the California Gold Rush. Gold was discovered in California, and people across the United States, well, mostly East Coast, because there was nobody in the middle at the time, flocked to, the, um, flocked to California to discover gold. A few of them made a fortune. Most of them never made a dime beyond their, you know, even enough to cover their expenses. One guy that did make, as the story goes, a lot of money is this guy on the right. Does anyone know who he is? Do you recognize him from history? Uh, Rockefeller? I'm sorry? Rockefeller? Nope. You probably are wearing his product. It was Levi Strauss. <laughs> and he, the story goes, made canvas pants for miners and made a lot of money selling equipment to miners versus mining. And there are other stories of you know, people that would cut hair, you know, cut hair for $25 a haircut back when $25 was really worth a lot of money. And you know, people servicing the miners made money. The miners themselves didn't. So think about ways, that's a Levi Strauss patch, it was too dark in this picture. But um, think about ways that you can serve underserved markets or, or niche markets that otherwise wouldn't be served. Here's some other examples. Uh, solar panels on the back of a sailboat. Uh, I saw this in a big hypermarket just the other day, Costco here locally. A backpack with solar panels on it so that when you're out, you can recharge your iPad or your um, you know, your iPhone, iPhone or um, other kinds of electronic devices. It doesn't provide a lot of power, but it provides, you know, we can't live without our electronics these days. This will provide enough electricity to recharge our electronics when we're out enjoying nature, listening to um, Metallica or something like that. <laughs> or you find these, these things are ubiquitous now. Solar panels and a small battery on the top of a, uh, uh, a power pole or a, a sign. So think about ways to uh, meet unmet needs. Start small, grow big. There's activity on this campus and elsewhere to do things like build solar panels into, um, into building materials, in this case shingles. 
This isn't a big market now, but it could be huge. So think about scalability. How, how can this thing grow larger? Divorce infrastructure. An idea that I'm actually exploring right now is there's a company in the Netherlands that makes a small household size, I think it's three kilowatt gas, natural gas turbine, a little jet engine, that will generate electricity and the waste heat then is used to heat the house and heat water. So it's sort of a miniature cogen plant. And I'm thinking if you marry that with solar cells in your roof and a relatively small uh, battery pack in your house, that might be a really interesting way to generate electricity you have, you can turn on the gas anytime to divorce yourself from at least the electrical grid infrastructure. I don't know if this will work or not, I'm going to run the numbers and see, it's just sort of interesting to me. And this company in, that, in the Netherlands is working assiduously to develop this uh, small turbine generator. You know, another way is like Levi Strauss, don't focus on the technology itself but the things around it, the balance of systems, that's what BOS stands for balance of system products. For instance, in the solar PV, solar PV space, racking systems, I think we talked about that last time, PV controllers, design and integration of PV systems, uh, operations and maintenance, all these things are ways you can make money uh, in the solar PV space without actually you know, building solar PV panels. And in many cases, there's some very, very successful companies out there. You're familiar with the words Schlumberger? Uh, they make, uh, they service oil well uh, and are very, very successful. But the last thing I want to leave you with is, you know, pursue your passion. Do you recognize these guys? The Steves, Steve Wozniak on the left and Steve Jobs on the right. This is back in the early days. That's the Apple I. This is the first thing. That, why did they build this? Did they build this because they wanted to be billionaires? Anyone know why they built it? They enjoyed it. They're, they were passionate, and they wanted to impress their friends at the at the uh, uh, San Jose, or, yeah, San Jose Homebrew Computing Club, because these guys, these geeks, would all get together and oh look, I can make mine play a tune, I can make mine do this that. Uh, Wozniak, who's you know probably a semi genius in this area, built the first Apple One. Steve Jobs, being the business genius, said, hey, this has commercial attention uh, potential. Apple II came along, and the rest is history. So they didn't set out to be billionaires; they pursued their passion respective passions, and was very, very successful, and changed the world. Many are, would argue much for the better. And Steve Jobs passing here this last, you know, the last few months uh, sort of brought that to the fore. That many, many people were very passionate about Steve Jobs and what he did. So we're going to get help. I'm going to just uh, want to point out one thing. that we, we do have a website in the Deming Center at the Lee School of Business. It has lots of good information. These slides, these slides will be... Um, Available at demingstartup.net. And so that's what I have to say about being a solar billionaire. Any questions? <laughs> All I ask is that when you become a billionaire, please remember the great time you had here at the University of <laughs> and you know, pay a little back. <laughs> yes? Uh, you have given us the lessons to how to start a business. But how to sustain this? Uh, come and get an MBA. <laughs> no, I'll be happy to talk about that offline. I think we're out of time. Thanks a lot, folks. Enjoy the rest of your stay here in Colorado. <laughs>